Okay. So now, now we go on to the public forum. Um, the um, co-signatories of the informal letters to Terrace Airport letter, um, Professors James Higgum, Elan Noy, Bronwyn Haywood, will speak regarding the informal letters Terrace Airport letter dated the 24th of January 2023. Welcome. Kia ora. Good morning, Mayor Major, Councillors and staff. Informed Leaders is an initiative of 11 leading academics from New Zealand universities that have a shared concern about the proposal to build an international airport at Taris. Our concerns are based on extensive bodies of published research in a range of disciplinary fields produced by leading New Zealand and international researchers. We believe that decisions that carry significant and long-term consequences should be fully informed by rigorous science. We are independent of commercial interests. We only seek to inform discussion and debate by providing timely insights that are independent of the advice which Christchurch International Airport Limited will soon produce. The leaders who we want to be informed are the people sitting around this table. The letter that we sent two weeks ago has now been supported by an additional 34 New Zealand and international academics. It is our shared view that the proposed Taris Airport should not proceed. Today, three of us will speak very briefly to our disciplinary perspectives on the proposed airport. My name is James Hyam, and I am a Distinguished Professor of Sustainable Tourism at the University of Otago. To begin with, air transportation is critically important to New Zealand. It connects us to our international markets and to the world. <laughs> However, we have long known about the catastrophic consequences of climate change and the need to avert the sorts of climate disasters that have hit the North Island in recent days. Over the last four years, we have seen unprecedented consensus on the changes and the challenges that we face in tourism in New Zealand. New directions are now embedded in various strategic documents. The proposed Taris Airport development is fundamentally at odds with the policy statements, strategy documents and commitments that give direction to tourism renewal after the COVID-19 pandemic. Aviation has a long history of defying what we might consider to be possible, but decarbonizing air transportation is by far the greatest technical challenge this industry has ever confronted. Despite promises of zero carbon aviation, progress is very, very slow. Analysis of industry promises reveals that many of the proposed sustainable technology solutions are announced and then hyped in the media only to subsequently fail and disappear. Meanwhile, studies clearly calculate that efficiency gains in jet aircraft have been far outweighed by exponential growth in passenger numbers. Overall emissions are growing, not shrinking, as we close in on 2030. Close analysis reveals that the psychological, political, commercial, and scientific technological dimensions of aviation are deeply interconnected. A coordinated approach is needed to transition away from high carbon socio-technical systems. Incremental advances in existing technologies will not solve the crisis in aviation emissions that we face. There is insufficient time today to even scratch the surface of available research, but the themes are clear. Firstly, the technical challenges in decarbonizing aviation are absolutely enormous. Secondly, the challenge of radically reducing aviation emissions is insurmountable without demand management. And thirdly, there is absolutely no scope for the aviation technology optimism that underpins the Taris Airport proposal. There is insufficient time today to read out in full the words of Sir Jonathan Porritt, Chair of Air New Zealand Sustainability Advisory Panel, or the words of the CEO of Airbus, both of which are sobering and directly relevant to our considerations. We will pro be providing you each with a copy of our submissions today, including these two quotes in full, and I really hope that you'll re read them closely. We appreciate the opportunity to speak in the public forum. Today, we will email a copy of our submission to all councillors and your CEO, we also ask that you attach our script in full to the public record of this meeting. We will keep you appraised of new information and research as it arises, and we welcome questions directly from any of you. 
We are available to provide independent advice to the City of Christchurch, and we will soon also launch a comprehensive index of relevant research on informedleaders.com, and this will be updated regularly. The responsibility you bear around Christchurch Airport's plans, directly or indirectly, is significant. Please be an informed leader as you guide the airport company via your directorships of CCHL, the Statement of Expectations and Associated Mechanisms. These decisions affect all New Zealanders now and for generations to come. Thank you for starting this open dialogue with us. I will now hand over to Professor Elan Noy, who is connecting with us via Zoom uh, from Wellington. And after Elon, we'll pass to Professor Bronwyn Haywood. Thank you. Kia ora, everyone. I hope you can, um, you can hear me. Um, I want, yes. Um, I, I only want to speak in my role as the chair in the economics of disasters, and I will not at all talk about climate change. Uh, my two colleagues will talk about climate change. Indeed, I want to argue that even if there were no uh, greenhouse gas emission issues uh, involved in the terrace development, it will still be a, a senseless development. I think what's unique about this proposal to develop Taras is that the ratepayers of Christchurch will in any case lose, whether or not Taras succeeds. If Taras fails, which I think is by far the most likely outcome, um, the owners of, of um, Seal, the, uh, the um, citizens of Christchurch, uh, will lose a lot of money. If Taras does succeed, which I don't think it's a plausible scenario, Christchurch payers, rate payers will still lose because this will drive away business, tourism, and services from Christchurch. So I only want to talk about two economic concepts that are uh, worthwhile mentioning in this in in this context, and that's the broken windows effect and the sunk um, policy effect. Can we switch um, slide? Thank you. Um, so if you look at the at the graph there, the the recovery in Christchurch. Um, after the earthquakes in 2010 and 2011 is a classic example of the broken windows effect. The, um, the uh, activity in the construction sector was the main driving force um, for the, uh, the good economic performance of Christchurch in the past decade. Um, and that has uh, masked um, a weakness in other sectors. Ultimately, reconstruction is, is now winding down and, and with that, Christchurch will need to find alternative economic drivers. Um, developing tariffs will exactly deprive Christchurch of those economic engines that could have and most plausibly would have um, been li the likely drivers of long-term prosperity in the city. Um, um, Seattle is not Otago Economic Development Agency, and I, very, I see very little reason why the rate pairs of Christchurch would want to undertake a risky um, um, development projects for Otago. The, the second concept I want to talk about is, is the sunk cost policy. Um, the, the sunk cost policy is the, the idea that you, you, when you decide to whether you want to continue investing in a project, you only invest it, uh, you already only decide that based on looking forward rather than looking backward. Whatever was already spent is gone and is now irrelevant. You have spent, um, I think, close to $45 million on um, purchasing land there and more on the cost associated with the administrating and servicing of this. Whatever was already spent is gone. The question you should be asking is, should you sink more money in this project? The longer it takes the council to realize that this project will end up harming Christchurch, the more money it would have already been sunk into it. I know you will probably say that the council only sets the strategic direction for Seattle, um, and surely that's the case, but surely that direction is not shooting the council in the foot and crippling the economy of Christchurch for the uh, foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, kia ora. Um, academics aren't good at speaking quickly, so I'll try and do it in three minutes so we've got time to ask some questions. I'm very grateful to... Um, to James and Elan. Um, I'm Bronwyn Hayward, a professor of political science and public policy. I'm a co-lead author and coordinator of the Cities and Infrastructure chapter for the IPCC, 
looking at best practice ways cities can protect our communities and our infrastructure in a changing climate. I just want to make three brief points. First, I'd really like to thank Mayor Phil Major for a really positive and powerful statement that he made in his campaign that we need to future-proof our city and district by recognising the impact of climate change and the changing regulations we're going to have to meet, that we need to make sure that we're working with the leading climate change experts who can advise the council, and that he wishes to support the big investment that's spent over the next 10 years in climate change and to see that huge investment spent wisely. It's a terrific statement. It was in line with 71% of other mayoral candidates surveyed last year, but it was one of the clearest. The second point that I want to make, though, is that there is a serious misalignment with the Council's own uh, decisions and strategic goals and its ownership and um, in investment via CL in Travis and Taris. Um, one of your goals is to think strategically and act as one organisation. But as Elan has just pointed out, we are in effect competing with ourselves, with our local tourism and Canterbury businesses against Otago in this process. And coming from Otago originally and loving this province, Otago will win in this process. Being best performance driven and accountable for results is also important to you. And this is not an accountable way to invest in a new airport, in new infrastructure, at a time when we know that air travel has a significant impact on carbon emissions. And the future liability that that opens the council to. As our attribution science improves, we're able to calculate exactly what contribution a large infrastructure build like this makes to the really big storms that we're seeing, for example, in Auckland. And I just note that France, for example, has banned all air travel now for between cities for shorter than three hour periods we could drive. But thirdly and most importantly, in allowing the issue of investment in tariffs to drag on, we're not reflecting the council's shared values, both its declaration of a climate emergency, which I was critical of at the time and tried to say, you have to be able to live up to what you're committing to. I'd rather we held the declarations of emergency for these terrible moments we're experiencing now. But Taris will become an increasingly unpopular and polarizing political decision. Public attitudes are already hardening around climate change, not just this climate crisis, but the West Coast flooding, Canterbury droughts and fires. Ratepayers want your climate leadership, and they don't want what they will increasingly perceive as a vanity project and capture by corporate industry. In particular, this organization that you have become invested with has not acted from public anecdotal responses in an open and transparent way in the sale of land. That's already raised concern about the integrity of the whole process. But more importantly than all of that, you have set a goal of being carbon neutral by 2030 as a council. I'm really proud of it. You've established a carbon, a climate change strategy and a carbon neutral target, target for Christchurch. Please put your money where your values are. Please rethink this decision now. We don't have to wait for a legal case. You don't have to wait endlessly for Taris to produce some information they keep promising will arrive. These are your values. This is our city. These are our decisions. Thank you so much for having us today. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got time for some questions. Did you have one, Jake? Yeah. One quick one. Thanks for that. That was a really excellent submission. Um, what I'm curious about is obviously I mean, it'd be impossible to misunderstand the message, don't build tariffs, but obviously a growth in aviation could still occur through the existing airports in South Island, and what I'd be keen to know what your view is, or, or your collective view is, on, on whether we should introduce a cap or a reduction on the amount of air travel into the existing South Island airports. It's, it's, it's a great question, and it's a very complex question. Uh, yes, there is um, capacity for uh, international airport arrivals uh, in the Lower South Island, uh, Christchurch, Dunedin, Queenstown, uh, Invercargill. Um, the point that I really want to emphasise is the need for socio-technical system-wide transitions. When it comes to aviation emissions, um, we've been very slow to respond in the ways that Bronwyn has mentioned in the case of the French government, for example. Banning flights, short-haul flights that compete with high-speed rail 
um, of two and a half hours of le or less, for example. And there are other really interesting initiatives coming into place in Europe. Um, so we need to shift the whole system. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, science and technology will play a crucial role in the future of aviation, but so will politics, and so will um, policy interventions, and so will psychological behaviour changes in air travellers. And we need to think of all of those things together. Yes, in other words. Yes. We, we should be looking at that as a policy solution. Absolutely. But also, think about the infrastructure, because it is far less carbon intensive to extend the infrastructure that you have in Christchurch than to actually build a whole new airport. And it's not just the flights. That's my timing to tell me we're up. It's not just the flights. It's the actual on-the-ground um, impact of movement, building, and construction. Thank you. That's good. And we've got one more from Aaron. Thank you. Yeah, so obviously early on the airport companies showed us modelling that having uh, tariffs reduces carbon, like the net amount of travel in, in and out of the South Island. So that would be, they would show us, but you show the example that aviation is growing, mm -hmm. and you're correct, aviation will continue to grow, whether, no matter what New Zealand bans, it will continue to grow. The world's population, even under COVID, grows at 83 million a year net quarter of them will travel by planes in their lifetime, most, most of them probably every year. Aviation itself has to change dramatically. The incremental statement, 100% correct, but from 1939 to 1945, we went from the biplane to the jet plane. The lightning was created at the end of the war. That's a phenomenal shift when it needs to happen. At the moment, there is no will, so there is no way. But it's once the will kicks in, then we can reduce carbon and air travel, like hydrogen, for instance, and the Christchurch project is a great example of that. What's your position on those changes and is that the way to go? Or are you purely in the camp, like um, my colleague here, where we start banning air travel? No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not at all in the camp of banning air travel because in New Zealand we are reliant on air travel, but we have to change the way we fly. Um, what I'm very keen for is for uh, this council to be well informed of the research in, in this space, um, because there's specialist research that addresses some of the generalizations that you've made, which are actually incorrect. Um, we've seen uh, efficiency gains in aviation over the decades, as you've mentioned, but despite those efficiency gains, we've seen skyrocketing emissions. Uh, the most recent paper I read asked, will aviation ever be sustainable? And it arrived at the conclusion that under current technologies, which is basically tube and wing uh, aviation technology, the answer is likely to be no. And we need to respond to that urgently. Thank you. Thank you very much. That, that's fantastic. And uh, I'd like to thank you three for, for coming and Elan on, um, on Zoom. And uh, thanks for your effort. Kia ora. Thanks, thanks so everyone. So we now move on to the, the next item, which is Gap Filler, the Green Lab, Life and Vacant Spaces will be updating us on the work they have accomplished as recipients of council funding. So first of all, we've got um, Kai from the Green Lab, and then we'll have Lydia from Vacant Spaces, and then Kate from Gap Filler. So welcome. Oh, sorry, Phil, it's Lydia first, uh, Life and Vacant Spaces. Is that right? Um, kia ora koutou, I'm Kate Finnerty, oh, so I'm from Gap Filler. There was a little bit of a mix up with the names. We were going to swap presentations oh, around. Did you just? Thought it easier just to <laughs> stick with what we've got. Yep. Well, um, welcome anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your time today and your valuable investment in creating a playful city for everybody. Um, the regeneration you report that you've got coming through um, details tangible outcomes for the last six months. So they're playful interventions that have helped to create a playful, livable city. I doubt we have time for questions, but feel free to send me an email or give me a ring. I've just got one slide up there. Um, it shows what we've achieved in the last financial year. So for a small organisation, it just shows the reach we have. Bit of brief background into place of play. So we're almost halfway through multi-year funding to make Ototahi a world capital of urban play. Uh, play invitations and social interactions in a city that kind of build community and build that connection to place and also using play as a way to engage more people in council decision-making and planning processes. So this funding has allowed a almost full-time urban play coordinator, that's me. Um, we've created a place of play brand with Aoriki Creative and a place of play hub at 153 High Street. 
So that's an urban frontage for urban play, also a place for workshops and co-working. Please feel free to drop in and see us sometime. Um, some of our projects are focused on young women, so we're using free skating events to create safe spaces for them to play in the city. We've also filmed people from diverse communities, filmed them in play and projected them in Cashel Street. It's about sort of celebrating diversity, but also bringing a bit of light to the central city at night. Um, we've brought play that is normally hidden from view into the city, um, slacklining events, community music festivals, uh, worked with Sokotika to bring public circus workshops into the city. Um, but there's a bunch of other stuff the report touches on, but what it doesn't speak about is all the advocating that we've been doing to enable play. So early on, we realised we can't do this on our own. We can't create an urban play capital of the world. So we've partnered with 16 other organisations that all bring their own expertise and flavour to creating an urban play capital. But it also needs to be even more than that. So we need to allow our citizens to um, create play. So you'll notice the outcomes they're all collaborating with others, either organisations or independent artists. We want to continue this trend, so we're building playful and resilient communities. So rather than one-off installations, this three-year funding really allows us to sink deeper into connecting and building relationships, creating play, leading and advocating. So I just want to briefly talk about one project that we're doing this. So last week we were told our Play About Place collaboration with Melbourne RMIT University Urban Play Lab has been successful. So the Australian Research Council has approved 80,000 towards this project. We're working with Dr. Troy Innocent from RMIT to develop this in Ōtutahi. So it's already run in Melbourne. This is the first city outside of Melbourne it's coming to. It's an urban art experience that brings the city to life via mixed reality a journey where players are actually prompted to reimagine the world through urban play. We've also got funds from Christchurch and NZ and Smart Christchurch, so that's 50,000. And the majority of this money is going to go into local artists to create new public works, but also playful events and installations in the streets. So that's awesome. Um, there's also monitoring and evaluation, so we're going to test and evaluate the impact of urban play on social well-being and community connection to place because it's no good if you don't have something to kind of back up what you're doing. So just in terms of timeline, um, it's all about timelines, isn't it? So in 2021, we began these talks. In 2022, we developed the framework and applied for funding. 2023, we've just been successful. So we're creating artworks, events and installations, and then launching the journey in 2024. So this um, long-term funding makes these longer-term projects really possible so we can really sink into it. So there's been a lot of conversations and groundwork, um, but we promise you that this sort of labour is about to bear fruit um, and allow this um, place of play to be stronger and have um, a lot more impact. Have I got any more time? Then we're all out. Yeah, we've got a minute. Yeah, okay, a minute. Yep, yeah, all right. So another thing we're focusing on is an urban play festival, so a bit of a cross between scape and the Buskers Festival, but we don't want to have the community of Christchurch so much as viewers, we want them to be participants in this. And the idea of having a festival for like a week long is that some projects will continue throughout the year. Oh, hello. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. all right. If we have time. Uh, yeah, yeah, far away. Yeah, carry on. Um, uh, yes, but some of the projects will continue throughout the year. Um, and so we're also looking at the climbing traverse in the central city, um, a musical walk operated by Senses, our play trail is part of the Urban Walking Festival. Um, so yeah, a whole lot of stuff going on. Thank okay. you. Tyler, have a quick question, please. Yeah, well, my jaw dropped looking at all of this, and I actually wondered who did all of this around the city, and it's, it's ah, you guys, so it's really cool. Okay. Um, just a quick question around the future of, of um, Gap Filler. Mm. Um, say in, a, in the long term, where do you sort of see yourself, and what's, the, what's your vision for the city? as a whole. I'm talking about the CBD, apologies, CBD. Yeah, okay. Um, like, I'm quite a visual person, so I just imagine, uh, is this kind of what you're aiming for? Like, a lot more colour, a lot more people in the streets feeling free to kind of play. At the moment, I mean, I'm an urban play coordinator, but I feel a little bit nervous playing in the city. There's a lot of shiny new buildings, if I'm honest. So it's about, you know, it's having someone like me to invite other people and say, come on, we can do this. Um, yeah, so like the climbing traverse in the city, so it's youth coming in, so they've got somewhere to play and actually being active. And there's so many different types of play, like explorers and creatives and storytellers, 
And I think this play about place will be able to bring a lot of that together because we've got a lot of audio tours already, um, but it's kind of bringing it together into this journey. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah colour, people, vibrancy, that's what I'm aiming for. <laughs> thank you very much for coming and sharing your enthusiasm for what you're doing. Oh, well, thank you. I know it's a hard time to be a council, so yep, yeah. well done. Good on you. <laughs> thank you. So next we've got either um, Green Lab or Life in Vacant Spaces, so I'm not going to make a mistake and say the wrong person. <laughs> so who have we got? <laughs> Kia ora everyone. Thank you very much for inviting us along to uh, update you today. Uh, my name is Paul Lonsdal. I'm a uh, volunteer trustee and current chair of the Life and Vacant Spaces Trust. We have um, seven volunteer uh, trustees, uh, one project director and one project coordinator. Lydia here with me this morning. Um, we just flip to the next slide. We are Lives. That's our affectionate name that people call us. Um, we bring life to vacant spaces. Uh, we connect owners of vacant land and buildings uh, to those who have big ideas to fill those spaces. We're passionate about helping people and helping create a city that Anything can happen and anyone can give something a go. Uh, we are a charitable trust and uh, we broker spaces for community groups, creative projects, uh, social enterprises and startups. We also organise the background stuff and this is stuff that people don't often uh, relate to our work. So sometimes people engage with our projects and may not even realise we've been involved. So we organise the leases and lease agreements, offer advice and project support, make sure insurance is covered help people through um, through the hoops, and we all know there's lots of hoops uh, involved in uh, getting projects off the ground in the city, and we uh, create spaces and activities. So we're currently celebrating, or celebrated our 10 year uh, anniversary last year with the book that you have in front of you. Um, currently we manage uh, 21 sites, and uh, of those sites, nine are inside, so they're actually inside uh, vacant uh, property and outside sites we have 12. They're not just located in the central city as some people may expect. They, uh, we currently do 12 sites in the, in the central city, uh, but we do uh, other suburban sites, Linwood, uh, New Brighton, and so on. So the total days of, of activation, and this is since our, our multi-year um, funding, uh, which we have really, really enjoyed uh, from the council, it has enabled us to uh, really focus on what we do. Uh, often, as you know, with um, yearly funding, uh, Two or three months in the lead up to the, the new funding round, we're spending time uh, organising reports, and um, that's really taken us off our game. So, we really have appreciated that um, that multi-year funding. The total days of activation is thirteen thousand one hundred ninety-one. Total projects over the period is seventy-five. And um, if you look on the book, we uh, have in total since our inception done over seven hundred projects. So you could extrapolate the days of activation by about. Uh, three and a half on that 13,000, uh, giving you an indication of the uh, size of our work. And I'll just pass on to uh, Lydia to update you on some of the projects. Kia ora katou. Um, I'm Lydia, as Paul said. I'm the project coordinator at Life in Vacant Spaces. I've been extremely privileged to have helped mentor and watch amazing people's ideas come to life. And I believe that the work Lives does can really help people connect with the cities, help with development, growth and change. I'm briefly just going to run through some projects um, that we've helped. Get Filler, the dance home mat, I'm sure you've all had a boogie on this by now. The coin operated ex laundry mat washing machine, power sport, four speakers um, with surround custom made sprung dance floor. And this can be found on Manchester Street um, and lives as the site broker for this. Um, uh, Robbie Gavola, she is a local artist and she had a site in the city centre. Um, and Robbie had her best January sales and commissions this year, being able to have access to something affordable for creatives in the city centre. This was the Lives Incubator site, I'll touch briefly in a minute on, um, and Lives also brokers this site at 110 Cashel Street. Um, the Green Lab, which we'll hear more about from Kai in a minute, um, so I'll just skip past that because you'll know more soon. The Learning Lounge um, was another site in the city centre brokered by Lives, another collaboration site for fostering learning and discovery. And I've covered some of this uh, information already as so we're celebrating our 10-year anniversary. You may have seen our, our uh, hoardings up through the city centre last year. 
um, with the book, which was supported uh, uh, with some funding and support from the uh, University of Canterbury. Um, but I just want to emphasise that um, we, we have done a lot of work in the city, not often recognised where, the, where the, the piece in the background that actually helps get these projects off the ground and in uh, and, and place. Uh, the, the projects have varied in scale and shape, uh, outputs from participants, uh, they have reached, and as I said, not many people uh, often realise we've been involved. But we do have seven uh, volunteer trustees who are all passionate about uh, the work that we do. We have some great staff that actually uh, put this stuff together, and you know, it's not a lot of time each week they have to uh, do this work, but um, when you see the scale of what the output is, uh, it'll give you some sort of idea uh, of what we actually uh, achieve. Um, Liz, as you can see, um, Liz feels that evaluation of projects is just as important as the project itself. This really helps us build on the learning so we become more knowledgeable as an organisation and can help with a wide range of different projects as no project is the same as you've just seen from the short mention of some that we do. Um, I'll just touch real briefly on the Lives Incubator, which is a 20-foot container. You can find it on 110 Cashel Street in the city centre. This is created by Lives, and the land is brokered by Lives as well. Um, it's a testing ground for communities, entrepreneurs, creatives, and educators. The Lives Incubator provides participants with accessible, affordable, and temporary creative city centre space where individuals can release their vision. Um, and we've got a, a criteria which we love to stick by, and I've got a short minute clip as well, which just has a bit of feedback from um, the participants. The Lives um, Incubator project has been a really great opportunity to get um, creatives into the city centre um, at a you know more affordable cost. It's made it more accessible. The incubator space itself has been a blank canvas for me just to come in and be a creator to like make it my own. With Lives, you guys have created a way where it's been super easy. We could just say, sweet, we've got this plan for two weeks. Does it align with your values? Awesome, let's put it all together um, and get it out there. That leaves hopefully some time for some questions. Who knows? It doesn't. <laughs> no, no, you, you, no, no, thank you very much, um, uh, Lydia and Paul, for, for coming in. And I like the bit where you help um, people jump through hoops because it's uh, it certainly sometimes gets a bit like that. And do you hire out the crystal ball? Sometimes I think I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for coming in and sharing with us no what problem. you do. Thank you. Thanks Wonderful. for having us. So we've got the Green Lab, Kai. Kia ora. Kia ora. Tēnā Ko Kai Hitchcock tōku ingoa, nā mihi nui ki nā tangata whenua, ko nai tahu, nō reira nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Morning, my name's Kai Hitchcock. My pronouns are they them, and I'm director at the Green Lab. Thank you for having me to speak this morning. Um, I'd briefly like to acknowledge um, that we're in a natural, nat national disaster and we're an organisation born from a disaster and we know the struggle that and time it takes to get through that. Um, so just thinking of all of those who are in the midst of it up north. Right. Can I click through here? Hello. Okay, hopefully. We're driving. All right. The Green Lab creates urban green spaces that support strong social connections and promote well-being in Ōtutahi Christchurch. A wealth of research shows that green environments have a fundamentally positive impact on our mental and physical health, thus creative greening is the vehicle through which we work to make change. 
We began as Greening the Rubble and Christchurch City Council has supported us since the early days. We have delivered well over 70 temporary greening projects in Ōtotahi with and for our communities over the past decade. Hopefully you get to read the slides. I'm not sure what the thing is doing. <laughs> All right. We are super grateful to have a three-year funding agreement with you. All of our current work is built on the platform of your support. We work to create a livable, connected city and to foster sustainable and environmental awareness. Your funding covers about 30 to 40% of our operational budget, which primarily goes towards paying our team for material budget for our community co-design projects and towards our events program. Your support enables community engagement, participation, creating volunteering and upskilling opportunities. It allows us to be active and engaged with others who are also engaged in shaping a unique identity for Ōtutahi and connecting communities or caring for the environment. Other funders see your backing and they support us as a result, so thank you. Here's a quick look at what we've done with your support since September 2021. We've delivered three iterations of a community co-working and event space called Understory. We designed all the furniture for the project and brought in 300 odd plants to each of the venues it was hosted in. The Art Centre, Te Matateki Tuawera, the terrace opposite Little Andromeda and the Welder, venues which Life and Vacant Spaces helped us secure. We invited people to join us for co-working, hosted events and ran our own community programming over the 16 months we were operational. Despite the ongoing impact of COVID during this time, each of the iterations was really well attended and hosted multiple events and groups. Being the Green Lab means that we test ideas, and at Understory we were testing a pay-as-you-can user model, which we hoped would increase options for people to work in the central city um, after the effects of the pandemic. At the end of 2022, we made a decision to pause Understory to look at the attendance data, purpose and numbers in detail, and make decisions about whether we seek specific funding in a more permanent venue, venue for the project. However, as part of Understory, we started several regular community of connection events, which are continuing. Queer Games Night, Wednesday Writers and Fadi Tiho. Queer Games Night is starting up again next week in collaboration with local Cafe Moment, and Wednesday Writers begins for this year this afternoon at Toyowaha. We've been working with the Neighbourhood Trust and their community to design and build the Mighty Ho Neighbourhood Garden, which is located behind the McFadden Centre. Volunteers from the community have participated at every step of this project, from community surveys and design hui to the physical build and planting out of this new community resource. 24 regular volunteers gave over 230 hours to the project to get it to the built stage, and another 20 or so extra participants have had their hands on the tools or in the dirt. The Neighbourhood Trust now has a regular gardening day, and we're about to revisit them to discuss the change of season planting and implement a worm farm. The fresh produce from this season have been included in kai boxes that support the community in Mighty Ho from the Fano Centre on Nancy Ave. Our impact here can be summed up by the community development worker Don, who said that they are incredibly grateful to have the experience and knowledge, processes, systems, timelines of when to do certain things, and access to the resources that enhance this community garden build. The Mighty Ho Neighbourhood Garden is a testament to the Green Lab's hard work and support for the Neighbourhood Trust as we endeavour to bring transformation to our community through this project. We've got a few new projects on the go at the moment and we're scoping some others. We're working to Tautoku the Kahukura Rongua Trust as they work on a project called Whakapai Te Whenua, a Kaputahi Reserve. And we've been on site to several hui and we'll be taking um, the lab, our mobile workspace, there this summer for them to use in their restoration mahi on the site. We've also been developing a project called Wahi Tayo the past year outside of our core funding with multiple organisations involved in the design process pro bono. By Tua Ori here, the performance components of this project have recently been commissioned for the Streets for People installation upcoming on Gloucester Street and we're working with other partners to see about delivering a larger proportion of the project elsewhere. As you can tell, no two days are the same at the Green Lab. We usually have a mixture of projects and events on the cards. If you'd like to know more about what we do, I'm really happy to connect in person, or you can find out more about us on thegreenlab.org.nz, um, and you can keep up with our projects on at the Green Lab NZ on both Facebook and Instagram. We really appreciate your ongoing support of Amahi. Thank you so much for your time. Amahi nui ki koto katoa. Thank you, Kai, for coming in. That's wonderful. Now, I think you'd agree we've got um, three very exciting, passionate groups who have all presented to us this morning, so well done to you all. Thank you.
So now we have Mark Gerard, who will um, speak to complement the Council on recently completed interpretation cultural markers project to the CBD. Welcome, Mark. Uh, Councillors, you can relax. It's a compliment. <laughs> <sighs> Uh, Tenakoto Mayor and Councillors, thank you for allowing Historic Places Canterbury to make this public forum presentation. Historic Places Canterbury wishes to commend and draw the Council's attention to the Wayfinder Culture and Heritage Project that has been recently completed in the CBD. Historic Places Canterbury regards the project's interpretation panels and cultural markers, design, content and placement throughout the CBD, a successful project that will enhance and experience those who are exploring our city. The project is the result of a partnership between Council, Naitahu, Otakaro, who inherited from Sarah, and, and assorted stakeholders. Whilst realising this is a public forum, Historic Places Canterbury respectfully requests that the Councils acknowledge and thank those involved in this project. In addition, as Chair, I wish to draw the Council's attention to the work of the Council's Linda Hunter, Heritage Team Leader Implementation, and the project team. Linda ensured that as HBC Chair and interested stakeholder, I was fully briefed and invited to workshops, etc. Can I ask councillors that you pass on my appreciation of her efforts and that of the team? Thank you for listening to this public forum presentation. Um, we've raised this issue before um, about bragging, and I'm mindful that I'm in a strange position because I'm in a room full of councillors, professional politicians, whose informal CV says you must have a skill for self-promotion. I also have a comms team, which is probably the largest one in Christchurch, um, under the jurist of the CR and the council. And I've got recent projects at the Christchurch Town Hall, which is an outstanding success, which should be the gem of our city. I've got the heritage strategy, our city, our tongue, and I don't know how many times I've emailed copies and told everybody other heritage group New Zealand I've been in contact with, and I couldn't tell you how many times it's probably been informally borrowed and used by various districts' councils. I've also got Canterbury Stories website, which is an outstanding project, which everybody I've talked up on the Canterbury project, round on the heritage groups through Canterbury I've told about, including a group of my Matty who are interested who informed me they're 10 kilometres within the Canterbury boundary, so they're interested. And we've also got this wayfinding one, which apparently didn't have a formal unveiling, and it's, the project team has now been disbanded. And I think it's about time, I've asked before, that this council bragged on its positive projects. We're quite happy to, to talk this one up. In fact, we've actually our newsletter, the Historic Places Aotearoa newsletter, Oculus, has already featured an article on this wayfinding project and, and, and the heritage strategy. So I would like you to start bragging about these good things if you wouldn't mind. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> the staff have done good work and I think they should I don't think they should tell the rest of the museum that they've done this. But thank you very much. Thank you any questions? Uh, yeah, th thank you, Mark. Has anyone got any questions? Mark. Okay. Tim, thank you. Yeah, look, Mark, I just want to say thank you for acknowledging the staff. They get hammered quite a lot. And um, it's really good that a individual from an organisation comes in and pets them on the back. So thank you very much for that. It's really easy that they do good work. And I should imagine nearly all this is related to the heritage team, which is probably the quality of the heritage team's efforts on those groups that are working with them. It's, it's, it, they have consistently briefed and kept everybody involved and involved the stakeholders as well as the professional relationships they have. Aaron, and then Pauline. Yeah, thanks, Mark, for coming in. It's always good to mark one of your positive days on the calendar. My, <laughs> my pen won't run out in a hurry. The, a um, <laughs> so community boards often leave their traditional site and go out and do um, meetings in the community. Do you think it would be a benefit if, and I don't think we've done it in this since I can remember, start the council meeting at one of the sites you know, just to draw attention to it and take the meeting to some of these locations and then maybe bring it back to the chamber, but just mix it up a little to draw attention to some of these great sites and projects around our city? It's a very good idea. In the past, um, substantial pre-quake, uh, while the council chamber was closed for refurbishment, the council used to hold meetings at the provincial council, the stone chamber of the provincial council meeting. So yes, I think it would be a very good idea. Um, I would relish the community boards moving as well as the council to some of the heritage buildings. The council's got 63 plus heritage buildings and there are other, other ones as well. Yes, I would. I think it would draw attention to these buildings, yes. Thank you. Pauline? 
Thank you, Mark. Thanks for giving up your time to come in and, and speak to us this morning. Um, we have started this year, you may have noticed if you've been watching any of the meetings, that where we celebrate any awards um, in recognition that the council staff um, receive for their projects, and they're turning out to be quite numerous. We, we have one or two every meeting now, for that very reason, because we do have to tell the good stories, the good news stories, and there's a lot of talent in this building. So um, I just wasn't sure if you were aware of that, but um, that's a new thing we've started. I am. It's just that the I think the council needs to reach outside of its immediate area and what it's doing. And I think sometimes the relationships are built within the professional relationships, like the council staff are talking to their fellow professionals, mm. the NGOs like in our network, et cetera, and a lot of groups like... Um, like I dealt with at least two representatives of historical societies out of Waimati, and they were intrigued about the Canterbury Stories website. They hadn't heard of it. And it's those groups that would feed in mm. to the work that the council's provided and maybe some more work in that area. I mean, the heritage team's aware of this, but they're busy. Yeah, that's right. It's the same old getting the, getting the um, information out there and communication. Yep. That's the biggest challenge. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you very Mark, much. and uh, very much appreciate you coming in. Thank you very much. Right, um, we will now move on to 3.2. We uh, Deputations by appointment, we have received no deputations. Presentation of petitions, we have no petitions. So we now go on to our reports, item five. And um, welcome, Joe. 